Section 5 of In Vino Veritas From Stages on Life's Way by Soren Kierkegaard Translated by Lee M. Hollander 1880-1972 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Section 5. The Dressmaker's Speech Well spoken, dear fellow banqueteers, well spoken. The longer I hear you speak, the more I grow convinced that you are fellow conspirators. I greet you as such. I understand you as such. For fellow conspirators one can make out from afar. And yet, what know you? what does your bit of theory to which you wish to give the appearance of experience your bit of experience which you make over into a theory what does it amount to for every now and then you believe her a moment and are caught in a moment no i know woman from her weak side that is to say i know her I shrink from no means to make sure about what I have learned, for I am a madman, and a madman one must be to understand her, and if one has not been one before, one will become a madman once one understands her. The robber has his hiding place by the noisy high road, and the ant lion his funnel in the loose sand and the pirate his haunts by the roaring sea likewise have i my fashion shop in the very midst of the teeming streets seductive irresistible to woman as is the venusberg to men there in a fashion shop one learns to know woman in a practical way and without any theoretical ado now if fashion meant nothing then that woman in the heat of her desire threw off all her clothing why then it would stand for something but this is not the case fashion is not plain sensuality not tolerated debauchery but an illicit trade in indecency authorized as proper and just as in heathen prussia the marriageable girl wore a bell whose ringing served as a signal to the men likewise is a woman's existence in fashion a continual bell ringing not for debauchees but for licorice voluptuaries people hold fortune to be a woman ah yes it is to be sure fickle still it is fickle in something as it may also give much and in so far it is not a woman no but fashion is a woman for fashion is fickleness in nonsense and is consistent only in its becoming ever more crazy one hour in my shop is worth more than days and years without if it really be one's desire to learn to know woman in my shop for it is the only one in the capital there is no thought of competition who forsooth would dare to enter into competition with one who has entirely devoted himself and is still devoting himself as high priest in this idol worship no there is not a distinguished assemblage which does not mention my name first and last and there is not a middle-class gathering where my name whenever mentioned does not inspire sacred awe like that of the king and there is no dress so idiotic but is accompanied by whispers of admiration when its owner proceeds down the hall provided it bears my name and there is not the lady of gentle birth who dares pass my shop by nor the girl of humble origin but passes it sighing and thinking if only i could afford it well neither was she deceived i deceived no one i furnish the finest goods and the most costly and at the lowest price indeed i sell below cost the fact is i do not wish to make a profit on the contrary every year i sacrifice large sums and yet do i mean to win i mean to 
I shall spend my last farthing in order to corrupt, in order to bribe the tools of fashion so that I may win the game. To me it is a delight beyond compare to unroll the most precious stuffs, to cut them out, to clip pieces from genuine Brussels lace in order to make a fool's costume. I sell at the lowest prices, genuine goods, and in style. You believe, perhaps, that woman wants to be dressed fashionably only at certain times? No such thing. She wants to be so all the time, and that is her only thought. For a woman does have a mind, only it is employed about as well as is the prodigal son's substance. For a woman does possess the power of reflection in an incredibly high degree and there is nothing so holy, but she will in no time discover it to be reconcilable with her finery. And the chiefest expression of finery is fashion. What wonder if she does discover it to be reconcilable, for is not fashion holy to her? And there is nothing so insignificant, but she certainly will know how to make it count in her finery and the most fascious expression of finery is fashion. And there is nothing, nothing in all her attire, not the least ribbon, of whose relation to fashion she has not a definite conception, and concerning which she is not immediately aware whether the lady who just passed by noticed it. Because for whose benefit does she dress, if not for other ladies? Even in my shop, where she comes to be fitted out a la mode, even there she is in fashion. Just as there is a special bathing costume and a special riding habit, likewise there is a particular kind of dress, which it is the fashion to wear to the dressmaker's shop. The costume is not insouciant in the same sense as is the negligee a lady is pleased to be surprised in earlier in the forenoon where the point is her belonging to the fair sex and the coquetry lies in her letting herself be surprised. The dressmaker costume, on the other hand, is calculated to be nonchalant and a bit careless without her being embarrassed thereby, because the dressmaker stands in a different relation to her from the cavalier. The coquetry here consists in thus showing herself to a man who, by reason of his station, does not presume to ask for the lady's womanly recognition, but must be content with the perquisites which fall abundantly to his share, without ever thinking of it, or without it even so much as entering her mind to play the lady before a dressmaker. The point is, therefore, that her being of the opposite sex is, in a certain sense, left out of consideration, and her coquetry invalidated by the superciliousness of the noble lady who would smile if anyone alluded to any relation existing between her and her dressmaker. When visited in her negligee, she conceals herself, thus displaying her charms by this very concealment. In my shop, she exposes her charms with the utmost nonchalance, for he is only a dressmaker, and she is a woman. Now her shawl slips down and bears some part of her body, and if I did not know what that means and what she expects, my reputation would be gone to the winds. Now she draws herself up, a priori fashion. Now she gesticulates, a posteriori. Now she sways to and fro in her hips. Now she looks at herself in the mirror and sees my admiring fizz behind her in the glass. Now she minces her words. Now she trips along with short steps. Now she hovers. Now she draws her foot after her in a slovenly fashion. Now she lets herself sink softly into an armchair, whilst I, with humble demeanor, offer her a flask of smelling salts, and with my adoration assuage her agitation. Now she strikes after me playfully. Now she drops her handkerchief, and, without as much as a single motion, lets her relaxed arm remain in its pendant position, whilst I bend down low to pick it up 
and return it to her receiving a little patronizing nod as a reward these are the ways of a lady of fashion when in my shop whether diogenes made any impression on the woman who was praying in a somewhat unbecoming posture when he asked her whether she did not believe the gods could see her from behind that i do not know but this i do know that if i should say to her ladyship kneeling down in church the folds of your gown do not fall according to fashion she would be more alarmed than if she had given offence to the gods woe to the outcast the male cinderella who has not comprehended this prodi immortales what pray is a woman who is not in fashion per dios obscuro and what when she is in fashion whether all this is true well make trial of it let the swain when his beloved one sinks rapturously on his breast whispering unintelligibly thine for ever and hides her head in his bosom let him but say to her my sweet kitty your coiffer is not at all in fashion possibly men don't give thought to this but he who knows it and has the reputation of knowing it he is the most dangerous man in the kingdom what blissful hours the lover passes with his sweetheart before marriage i do not know but of the blissful hours she spends in my shop he hasn't the slightest inkling either without my special license and sanction a marriage is null and void anyway or else an entirely plebeian affair let it be the very moment when they are to meet before the altar let her step forward with the very best conscience in the world that everything was bought in my shop and tried on there and now if i were to rush up and exclaim but mercy gracious lady your myrtle wreath is all awry why the whole ceremony might be postponed for aught i know but men do not suspect these things one must be a dressmaker to know so immense is the power of reflection needed to fathom a woman's thought that only a man who dedicates himself wholly to the task will succeed and even then only if gifted to start with happy therefore the man who does not associate with any woman for she is not his anyway even if she be no other man's for she is possessed by that phantom born of the unnatural intercourse of woman's reflection with itself fashion do you see for this reason should woman always swear by fashion then were there some force in their oath for after all fashion is the thing she is always thinking of the only thing she can think together with and into everything for instance the glad message has gone forth from my shop to all fashionable ladies that fashion decrees the use of a particular kind of headdress to be worn in church and that this headdress again must be somewhat different for high mass and for the afternoon service now when the bells are ringing the carriage stops in front of my door her ladyship descends for also this has been decreed that no one can adjust her headdress save i the fashion dealer i rush out make low bows and lead her into my cabinet and whilst she languishingly reposes i put everything in order now she is ready and has looked at herself in the mirror quick as any messenger of the gods i hasten in advance open the door of my cabinet with a bow then hasten to the door of my shop and lay my arm on my breast like some oriental slave but encouraged by a gracious courtesy i even dare to throw her an adoring and admiring kiss now she is seated in her carriage oh dear she left her hymn-book behind i hasten out again and hand it to her through the carriage window i permit myself once more to remind her to hold her head a trifle more to the right 
and herself to arrange things should her headdress become a bit disordered when descending she drives away and is edified you believe perhaps that it is only great ladies who worship fashion but far from it look at my seamstresses for whose dress i spare no expense so that the dogmas of fashion may be proclaimed most emphatically from my shop they form a chorus of half-witted creatures and i myself lead them on as high priest as a shining example squandering all solely in order to make all womankind ridiculous and when a seducer makes the boast that every woman's virtue has its price i do not believe him but i do believe that every woman at an early time will be crazed by the maddening and defiling introspection taught her by fashion which will corrupt her more thoroughly than being seduced i have made trial more than once if not able to corrupt her myself i set on her a few of fashion slaves of her own station for just as one may train rats to bite rats likewise is the crazed woman's sting like that of the tarantula and most especially dangerous is it when some man lends his help whether i serve the devil or god i do not know but i am right i shall be right i will be so long as i possess a single farthing i will be until the blood spurts out of my fingers the physiologist pictures the shape of woman to show the dreadful effects of wearing a corset and beside it he draws a picture of her normal figure that is all entirely correct but only one of the drawings has the validity of truth they all wear corsets describe therefore the miserable stunted perversity of the fashion mad woman describe the insidious introspection devouring her and then describe the womanly modesty which least of all knows about itself do so and you have judged woman have in very truth passed terrible sentence on her if ever i discover such a girl who is contented and demure and not yet corrupted by indecent intercourse with women she shall fall nevertheless i shall catch her in my toils already she stands at the sacrificial altar that is to say in my shop with the most scornful glance a haughty nonchalance can assume i measure her appearance she perishes with fright a peal of laughter from the adjoining room where sit my trained accomplices annihilates her and afterwards when i have gotten her rigged up a la mode and she looks crazier than a lunatic as crazy as one who would not be accepted even in a lunatic asylum then she leaves me in a state of bliss no man not even a god were able to inspire fear in her for is she not dressed in fashion do you comprehend me now do you comprehend why i call you fellow conspirators even though in a distant way do you now comprehend my conception of woman everything in life is a matter of fashion the fear of god is a matter of fashion and so are love and crinolines and a ring through the nose to the utmost of my ability will i therefore come to the support of the exalted genius who wishes to laugh at the most ridiculous of all animals if woman has reduced everything to a matter of fashion then will i with the help of fashion prostitute her as she deserves to be i have no peace i the dressmaker my soul rages when i think of my task she will yet be made to wear a ring through her nose seek therefore no sweetheart abandon love as you would the most dangerous neighborhood for the one whom you love would also be made to go with a ring through her nose end of section five